familiar with the Venus object. Okay. Uh, I'll go through it briefly to give you an idea of what we're working for. We feel that the way the world is going today is completely downhill. That our language was designed hundreds of years ago. And we really talk at each other than to one another. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the proposals of the Venus Project. If I fail to answer your questions, you have to let me know that. Raise your hand and say, you didn't answer my question. Don't be polite. Is there anything you don't understand? Question it. It's up to you now. OK, now these are the assumptions we make, that you will have war, poverty, depression continuously until all the nations of the world are brought together and the earth is used as a common heritage, common heritage of all the world's people. If you don't understand that, if you think that money is the only thing which you're brought up to believe in in this culture, if you're stranded on an island with $10 million and there's no water, no fish, no arable land, you have nothing. Money is a nothing thing. It never did represent the physical entities that enable us to live. Politicians, all of them, can do nothing to make the world a better place. They do not understand technology. And they do not understand what to do. All nations are going downhill now. This is the first time in history that there's been wars all over the world and we've had unemployment. War has always been big business. Get that through your head. It's not to bring democracy to other countries. It's to exploit them, use them, in whatever way we can. I want to try to get that across to you. Let's assume that you are drafted into the army. You put up your life to defend the country. If that's true, then we should draft all the war industries so no one makes a buck out of war, and it's real. If you draft all the industries so they get the same basis of pay as the soldiers that put their lives up to defend this country, it's real. But if people make millions of dollars selling machine guns, submarines, aircraft, it's not real. It's big business. Now, there's a book written called Arms and the Men. Did anyone ever hear of it? That amazing. A friend of mine was a pilot in World War II, World War I. He flew over a German munition dump called I.J. Farben and had orders not to bomb it. He didn't know why. He said he flew over eight times with strict orders not to bomb it. After the war, he found out why. DuPont had holdings in I.J. Farben, an American company. Now, of course, another aspect of war. We've been killing Japanese soldiers in the South Pacific Islands in World War II. The truth is, Alexander P.T. Seversky of Seversky Aircraft Company said that what we needed at that time was long-range bombers to knock out the power projects in Germany, the jams, the dams, the electric generators, and shut down the factories. But if you show, shoot soldiers on every island in trenches, it has nothing to do with bringing war to an end. War has always been big business, loaded with lies and deceptions. Now, how many Americans knew that American soldiers used to cut off Japanese ears and make necklaces of them? One person, amazing. The book is called A New American History. If you really want to know where we're at, we're in the same case as all other nations, corrupt as hell. The Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara, their writers said that this is the most corrupt country in the world. Now what does that mean exactly? That means that the, according to Charles A. Lindbergh, his father advocated that the government print money 
and make it available to people, not private banks. Private banks are permitted to lend out money more than they have. They can lend out more and collect interest on that. Well, that's utterly corrupt. If you don't understand that, we always had wars, recession, boom, bust, and what they do in our school books, our history books in particular, do not describe our country as it was or as it is. All history books and all the people back in our history books always did the right thing. They never made any mistakes. They never made any errors trying to, your history book, everybody says the right thing. There's no such people. That's all over the world. Where do you think we got this land from? We took it by force and violence from the Indians. Then we took California and New Mexico. After we stole all the land we needed, they put up the sign, thou shalt not steal. What is true of America is true of all the other countries. When they say the sun never sets on England, how well do you think England got all those country controls in the old days? They took it. Now, if they lost, because they would have been called thieves, now they're called conquerors, great conquerors. So, I say, well, if you understand what I'm talking about, the money system is the greatest fraud ever put forth on people. Think of this now. Today, America has 300 submarines. Each one, not according to me, according to the War Department, has more destructive power than all the wars in history. One summary. Now, where can you go with that? What can you accomplish? But there's a place for particular senators and government officials. They build a place under a mountain for them to go to in case of nuclear war. Well, there's six months' supply of food, water, all the necessities of life. What do you come out to? You ever think of that? A burnt out radioactive, wasted area. How stupid can you be? The Pentagon is made of people, army people. And army people are notoriously stupid because they're not very well read. They don't understand this. What you'd have in Washington if we had a sane society, meaning mentally sane, you'd have a Pentagon of sociologists, social scientists, who can bridge the difference between nations. Soldiers are killing machines. They're trained to kill. You look at them and say, well, at least they're fighting for our country. No, they're not. They're fighting for oil, and they're fighting for economic advantage. I'm sorry to say what I'm saying. I don't like what I'm saying. I wish we were decent folks, but we're not. I don't own any munition companies. I have no political ambitions. I think that politicians say things people like to hear. They have nothing to do with the truth. They don't even know what the truth is. There are some people that I meet that call themselves truth seekers. In order to be a truth seeker, you'd have to know everything to know what the truth is. So there's no such thing. Then there are other people that say man is something more than the sum of his parts. I'm sure you've heard that. So is a can of tomato sauce. So is a Plot more than the sum of it. So what? Man creates the filth in the atmosphere. Pollution of the oceans, the land, man. Man operates guided missiles. They don't go by themselves. Man builds warships. It's a human being that ultimately drops a bomb on cities and they pin a metal on them. And they put an X on the fuselage for how many villages you bombed out. And people think, well, that's good. At least I'm defending my country. Then there's another group of Americans that think that we used to have a democracy, but the, the governments of recent times took it away from us. You've never had a democracy. Let me tell you why you've never had a democracy. And let me tell you what I think a true democracy would be. Our president would get up and criticize another country for an hour or an hour and a half. When he's through, we would invite the prime minister of that country on the air to give his side of view. You know, if you're accused of anything today, you have the right to face your accuser in court. So whenever you criticize another nation, invite them on, give their point of view. 
then invite the Prime Minister of Sweden. Is that both full of shit? This is how I see it. This is what I'm talking about. In a democracy, people say, well, at least our participate. It's a participatory democracy that I believe in. So I always get those people all the time when I say, do you believe in a participatory democracy? Yes, I do. Did you vote for the space program? Well, I guess not. Did you vote for the Vietnam War? I guess not. Did you vote for the design of the Capitol building or the highways in America? I guess not. What the hell do you participate? What an illusion. And there it is out there all the time, and you think that you participate in selection of politicians. You don't. They are picked for you. If you had a democracy, you'd have 4,000 political parties, and they would disagree and argue with each other. And if you had a democracy, you'd have religion on the uh, all religions on Sunday. Then you'd have atheists and agnostics giving their point of view. That's a democracy. But when you've got generals on the major broadcasting station and admirals of the Navy and vested interest pitching their pitch for more armament, it's your money that goes into armament. And when you bomb other cities, no matter where they're at, you're building hatred, human hatred for the future. And then there's another group of people that think they're smart. They're against abortion. You imagine they'd be against war because they're killing thousands of people, bombing children, everybody, unborn children, mothers. So what's the matter with these people? Well, I tell you what's the matter. They are cerebral insufficient. They don't have enough stuff up here to put anything together. They even created gods. They used to have many gods in the old days. Then they downsized them, finally come down to one god. Now the Jewish god says, if a man takes your son's eye out, you take his son's eye out. The Christian god says, when a man punches you, turn the other cheek. All these gods are different. So when a guy says, do you believe in God? Which one, Einstein said to me. When I asked him, do you believe in God? He says, which one? There's so many different concepts of God. So many different concepts of right and wrong, good and bad. Now I'll tell you a little bit about right and wrong. And if you're black, listen to me carefully. If you're brought up in the deep south, there's a white man. And it's an uneducated region. You will speak with a southern accent. And you'd say things like, I'm gonna get me a nigga, I'm gonna kick his ass in. Where do you think that comes from? That comes from an environment. That's not that the person is mentally ill. There's nothing wrong with a southerner or a member of the Ku Klux Klan. That's the environment he was brought up in. And the psychologists today and psychiatrists are so stupid that they deal with the individual. It's really the environment that makes them that way. If you don't understand me, if you were brought up as a little baby or in the, by the headhunters of the Amazon, such so say you, and I said to you, doesn't it bother you to have 10 shrunken heads? You might say, yes, my brother has 20. <laughs> so he would be perfectly well adjusted where he's coming from. There are no good or bad people. There are people brought up in different environments which they believe in. If you're brought up in Nazi Germany as a baby, all you see is Heil Hitler, Deutschland über alles, meaning Germany above all. You're a Nazi, if you've never seen anything. If you still don't understand me, if you take a nice Jewish boy and bring him up in Nazi family, very young, he says, a Nazi. You take a Nazi baby, bring him up by a Jewish family, he's a nice Jewish boy. So really, what are people? People cannot think or reason. Let me back that up now so you don't get mad at me. It's very easy to get mad at what I'm saying. The reason we can't think is because we're brought up in a fixed culture with fixed values. When you're very young, they start pumping crap in your head. Who loves you more than anybody in the world? And the baby says, I don't know, your mommy and daddy. What's the greatest country in the world? I don't know, the good old USA. Of course the good old USA. And you brought up in Saudi Arabia, you brought up in Dubai, you brought up in Germany, same pitch, okay? The only real answer is to declare the earth as the common heritage of all the world's people. And all the resources, 
shared by all the world people. If you still don't understand that, what we spent in World War II, what we, the Germans, the French, the British, all the money we spent on equipment could have built hospitals all over the world, schools all over the world, wipe out the slums all over the world. How stupid can you be? Now, how many of you ever heard of a book called Mind in the Making by James Harvey Robinson? Not even available in your school library, not one hand. How many of you ever heard of the book called Arms and the Man? It appeared in Fortune magazine explaining the profit system of war. And there was one time even Fortune magazine ran that. And then there's another book called Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase. How many of you ever heard of that? What happened to these books? There was another book called A Hundred Million Guinea Pigs. Anybody here ever hear of it? It was a bestseller in America. It attacked the drug industries. They said, why don't the drug industries try to find out about carrot juice or celery juice or natural approaches to disease? Because there's no money in it. You get three bucks or five bucks per pill, so why should they? So the public, after that book was a bestseller, demanded that a new agency be provided in Washington called the Pure Food and Drug Administration. Now it's infiltrated by the people of the drug company. Anybody know that? Amazing. One person, two persons, three persons. So, so you see, we are not a free country. We never have been. We never had a democracy. In a democracy, where freedom people, they always say that people are born equal. They're not. Some are tall, some are short, some are fat, some are not that too good eyesight. We are not born equal. But what they're trying to say is all people should be given an equal opportunity. You can't do that if you give a little girl a doll. You're already programming it. If you tie a big bow in a little girl's hair, you're programming it for a certain role. When my little girl was five, she says, I want an electric train. I don't want a doll. You give a little girl a washing machine, you are programming it. The reason boys are more inventive than women is not because men are different. It's because men are given a wider range. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you don't know what that means, which you won't get in your school books. When we were little boys, we used to piss together in the field and cut across one another's piss streams. And another kid said, do you ever see a kid take a shit? He said, no. <laughs> Come on, Billy's going to take a shit, but he wants <laughs> Here's what they got. The way it came out, this enabled a man to design an extruding machine. You know what that is? A machine that extrudes aluminum. He got it from another kid taking a shit. <laughs> now, men, when, when I was a kid, we used to throw spiders at girls. And you know, I, the girls would go back like that. Today, they collect spiders. But, so you see, if given the same range that men are given, if a man is having an affair with five women at the same time, he's called Don Juan. If a girl screws around with two guys, she's a tramp. Who wrote the book? The men. So think about it. You're second rate. And so God doesn't hang a picker on a male and say, don't use it until you get married. It would pop out the day you got married. So he got all this bullshit out there, and there's really no such thing as profanity. Because if you bake a pie, I don't know, you you drop it, you might say fiddly dee. If he baked a pie, he might say shit. That means I'm sorry I dropped a pie. So it was fiddly dee. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's no bad words. You're brought up in an environment. What do you use that kind of language? When I spoke at Columbia University, they said, do you have to use that kind of language? Would you use that kind of language if your mother was here? So I said, mother, will you stand up? And keep <laughs> There's no bad language. But what is terrible is prejudice and discrimination. So years ago, this pilot that I was telling you about, that flew over German munition plants, he was a member of an organization, thank you, called Technocracy. How many of you have heard of technocracy? Okay, the technocrats believe in using science and technology rather than politics 
as a means of governing people. So I attended about two or three of their meetings, and I enlisted, I, I joined, I found it pretty good. Then I noticed there were no blacks in the organization. So I walked over to Howard Scott, who was the chief engineer, and I said, how come there's no blacks? He said, let them start their own section. And I said, well, how come there's no Orientals? He said, the Oriental mind can't grasp technology. That was in the old days. So I knew, I tried to tell him that you're looking at the first generation Orientals, but by the third or fourth generation, they'd be just like us. And we know a regional dialect. And he said, no, no, the Oriental mind will never grasp technology. He died a long time ago, and so did his ideas with him. There's nothing the matter with technocracy at those except those areas which I couldn't agree with, so I resigned because I could not defend it. So then I said to myself, what is needed? How can you design a society where there's no conflict? Well, there's always been conflict. There's always been corruption in government. There's always been wars, and the Bible says there will always be wars and rumors of wars. And we shall always have the poor amongst us. This is in your Bible. I can't accept that crap. I believe that man makes God in his own image, some jerk that you pray to. And this guy sits on the throne, and he looks down, and he can see everything you're doing, whether you're in this concrete building or anything else. They tell us that God made everything, every galaxy, every universe, every bug, every plant. And then Jesus proceeds to insult him. Just before they crucified him, he looked up and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But this guy created everything. You don't know how to tell them. They don't know what they're doing. That's what I mean by an insult. When a farmer says, dear God, we have a drought, my corn is drying up, how about some rain? My God, gee, thanks for telling me, I didn't think of that. You know, we reduce God to some jackass that gets angry, creates floods, sins, injury, pain. And if you don't follow the Holy Scriptures, you burn eternally. That doesn't sound like God. That sounds like a psychopath. <laughs> when I tell you God is made in the image of man, you go to different countries, the Indians concept, happy hunting ground. No Indian pictures stainless steel automobiles. No Eskimo can dream of walking on a palm fringe beach unless they've seen movies. So it means that you can't think of anything unless it's within the culture that you're brought up in. That's why each little group thinks they're okay. The Nazis used to call themselves the master race. The Jews called it God's chosen people. Well, if you start doing that sort of thing, you're separating people. And when you have women's studies, Polish studies, Jewish studies, black studies, you're separating people. All people need clean air, clean water, arable land, and a relevant education. That means how we depend on the forest if we dump stuff into the oceans. I've got to tell you this. About 45 years ago, the U.S. Army, the United States Army, dumped 65 tons of nerve gas in Miami. How many of you knew that? Near the one hand, two hands, off the coast of, of Miami, near the Gulf Stream. How can you love your country and do things like that? Don't you see that? Einstein th thought that if he gave them the formula and Oppenheimer for the atom bomb, surely man would be wise enough to demonstrate it out at sea and say to Japan, we don't want to drop it over your country. This is what we can do if you don't drop your arms now. But no, they dropped it on Hiroshima and Nagasaki because they're brought up with the old crap in the Bible that says revenge is sweet. You do things like that, you build hatred for centuries. So I'm trying to tell you things. Sure, I can give a beautiful lecture on God bless America. Who the hell are you to tell God who to bless? If he made everybody and you say, God bless America, who are you to do that? Everybody knows what God wants, except God. Because man makes God in his own image. A guy that gets angry, creates floods, that's not God. And then I went to another church. I was looking for the truth. In the early days when I didn't know any better, I was looking for the truth. 
So I went to sat satanic churches because I wanted to see what they say. They believe that Satan rules the world. There's more evidence to demonstrate that than God. Serial killers, bombs, continuous war, dumping stuff in the ocean, poisoning the atmosphere. They seem to have a chip that sounds right. Of course, I don't buy that crap either. But I'm just telling you what different people believe, and they're just as sincere as you are. The Japanese are brought up with the same values about you as you devise about them. And we talk about Nazis as being cruel. If you get a book by H.G. Uh, Wells called Outline of History, in that book he says the U.S. was moving about a thousand Germans toward the campgrounds, but the German army was catching up with them, so they put them in a big hole machine on them all. Well, we don't have any real movies on anti-war. Maybe All the Quiet on the Western Front or The Vickers. Do you know how many movies were made pro-war? Thousands of them. And I remember the original All the Quiet on the Western Front. A British man grabs a barbed bar wire, he's about to climb over, and a bomb goes off and it shows two hands on the barbed wire. Well, they never show the horrors of war, because enlistment wouldn't go up. And the boys in the army, a lot of them think they're defending this country. The only way to defend this country is to build a bridge between nations. So I said to myself years ago, different nations think differently. They have different values. Some of them have 20 wives, and that's normal to that country. So how the hell are they going to bridge the difference between nations? So what I did when I was 21 years old, I attended meetings of the Ku Klux Klan, and I dissolved it in a month and a half. That is in Miami. Then I attended meetings of the White Citizen Council. They hate foreigners. And I dissolved it in one month. Then I asked some people in Brooklyn, who are the most backward people in the area? And they said, well, we believe the Arabs are on Atlantic Avenue. I said, what makes you think they're backward? They still believe the Earth is flat. So I said, boy, I've got to get to those guys. <laughs> if I can't get to those guys, how am I going to change the world? So I, I looked up the guy that was in charge. His name was Elbaz. I called him, and I said, can I come and talk to you, Elbaz? He said in this type dialect, he said, from where your father be born? I said, Lebanon. He very good, very good. You are an Arab? I said, eh. That means, uh, yes, in Arabic. I'm not an Arab. So he said, come and saw me. That means come and see me. So I came to see him. And he said to me, you believe the world is round? I said, yes. That means, in his background, it can't be. So I pointed to his head, showing me how smart he was. He said, if the world he drowned, man fall me down here. All the water, he fall me down from the world. Do you understand that now? And I figured, boy, I gotta get to this guy if I want to change the world. So I put a balloon in his hand, and I rubbed the balloon with fur fast. And I put some cornflakes in his hand and told him to hold it away from the balloon. Okay. <laughs> And all the cornflakes, when you rub it, you generate static electricity, mm -hmm. and all the cornflakes jumped up to the balloon. And he said, world he magnet? I said, eh, ah. He went into the next room and explained that to the Arab. Now look, the average person doesn't like to confront people that think differently than they do. Now you can get along with people who say, look, folks, the Earth is a little round and a little flat, and you get along with a lot of people. But that's not the business of science. They used to believe that the stars went around the world, that the world was the center of the universe. And so that was smashed. We still believe in gods and demons. If you go to Mexico, the rooms were at different heights in the middle of class home. And I asked, why do you make all the rooms at a different height? Because the devil, does, that the devil, devil doesn't like to walk up or down stairs. He likes to walk on a flat plane. And they believe that with a straight face, just like a Christian does this before he goes off a diving board or into a bullfight. Now try to picture this. In ancient Rome, maybe on Saturday, I'm not sure of the day, the whole family would come to see Christians being fed the lions. And the kids would say, Daddy, can we come next week to see Christians 
being fed the lions if you behave yourself. <laughs> so, are these kids insane? No. That was normal to that time. If you're brought up in the Arab world, a man looks at an object like he's not that interested in it. He says, how much do you want for that? And he says, ten dollars. I give you three dollars. Well, that's normal to that country. When the guy comes to Sears, the Arab, he says, how much do you want for the clerk? Like he's not that interested. The clerk doesn't even know. The clerk picks it up, he says, eight ninety-five. I give you two dollars, goddamn fellow. It's normal for that person where they're coming from to do that. Do you see that? There are no good or bad people. A serial killer is made that way. If he's genetically damaged, he's not responsible. If his brain is warped, he's not responsible. And the psychiatrists work ass backwards. They try to change the person. It's really the culture that fucks people off badly. You understand what I'm saying? The culture. There's no bad words. They're just different expressions. So, all of your congressmen lie. The Democrats lie about the Republicans. The Republicans lie about the Democrats. And even, even guys like Carl Sagan try, try, tried to raise money to communicate with extraterrestrials. They want to build big antennas. If the Democrats can't communicate with the Republicans, <laughs> the husbands and wives have difficulty communicating, how the hell are you going to communicate with extraterrestrials? Let's assume there were extraterrestrials. Anything that can travel a hundred million light years through space is not like us. They don't want to meet your president. The president would be an asshole. He's <laughs> <laughs> an ignorant man, Bush and his whole group, very stupid. The Democrats just a little behind. But there's no such thing as intelligent government. Government has managed to keep things the way they are. People are elected to political office not to change things, but to keep things as they are. The same with universities. They depend on funding from big corporations. So guys like me don't get much of a chance to speak to university students. I'm considered not a boat rocker, but a boat sinker. So if you sink the boat, if you speak frankly in the truth, your chances of getting on radio, NBC, CBS, are zero, because they depend on sponsors. When I was on Larry King, I was on four times, he said to me, you attack the drug companies, the cigarette companies, the auto companies. I never did attack the auto companies. This is what I said on the Larry King show. I said, if you have an airbag in front of you, it's all right. But if you get hit on the side, your head goes right through the glass. The whole inside has to be an airbag. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So he said, why don't they do that? I said, Larry, I can't answer that. I can only tell you they don't do it. Then I said, if you, if you don't want war, Larry, you have to bring all the people of the world together. And they don't know how to do that. They want to bring democracy there. You can't bring democracy to a nation that has a different set of values unless they choose it. And how do they choose it? through education. Can you educate them? Of course not. They, they, you can't control people unless you make them pretty much uninformed, as best you can. The reason you do that, you can control them. If you teach people to think and reason, you can't, in times of war, get any, anybody enlist in the army. You can't move people in mass, so you make them all alike. Here's what I mean by that. If we taught history, real history, the new American history, to be history of our country, the mistakes we made, the good things we did, that would be for all nations. So people do not always do the right thing. They can't. And so you live in a managed world. And your kids in the future will say to you, wasn't it obvious that you paid off senators, you paid off governors, you paid off different people to get your will? Isn't it obvious? I guess not. And so, if you do away with the money system, you can't have sale of drugs. You can't pay off senators. You can't buy people. You understand what I'm saying? As long as you've got money, no matter who you elect, you say, well, maybe if we elect decent people in government, no way. Even if you had the most decent people in the world, taken from the best churches you like, 
If you ran out of resources, be lying, cheating, killing, stealing. It's resources that people need, not money. Access to resources. Is there anybody who has difficulty with that? So I will just take another drink, if you don't mind. Thank you. So what we advocate, then, is a resource-based economy. No money. Resources mean, today, normal people, normal means screwed up. Normal people say, how much will it cost to build a new city like you have up there? And this is the question. The real question is, do we have the resources to house everyone on Earth, take care of everybody medically, and every other? Yes, we do. We have more than enough resources. If you consider the money spent in World War II, we could have wiped out the slums all over the world. Educated people build the best universities free of charge. Why do we do it free of charge? Because the smarter the kids are, the richer all of us are. Every kid shooting up drugs, hanging out in malls. Why? They have no place to go. There should be art centers, music centers, cultural centers, theater groups where people can go. They hang out in malls and coke stands because there's no place to go. And the government, I'm going to say this, the government and industry doesn't give a shit about people. Proof now. They would not outsource. If I drive a big factory, if I pay my help more than the minimum wage, I can't stay in business if he outsourced it to China. You understand? You're not going to invest in a company that builds playgrounds for the women's children that work in the factory. You want the money spent on products, advertising, so the income is greater, so you invest that. So we're all sons of bitches in the monetary system. It makes us that way. When I say if you're not, consult your bank account to see who you are. So it's very difficult in a monetary system to be decent or fair. A lawyer is a guy who can take language and do whatever the hell he wants with it. He can best believe he's a good lawyer. He can make your system sound bad. So in the future, there'll be no lawyers, no bankers, no investment brokers, no one that makes money by not service, donating service to the country. So in the future, you'll have structural engineers, chemical engineers. They don't run the country, by the way. They really deal with problems. That's hard to understand. I'm not talking about a technical elite. I have just as much fear of that of any other system. I'm talking about the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. That's what I'm talking about. So what we have to do first is a global survey of what we have, how much arable land, how many factories we have, how many coal mines, trucks, ships, planes, and by the amount that we have, we can determine knowing how many cases of cystic fibrosis and all the other physical ills, that tells us how many hospitals we build. Not some jackass saying, I think I'll build a hospital here. It's a good area, good community, and has future potential. No, you do a survey to see what's needed and you provide for those needs. If you don't do that, you're going to have war and crime continuously. There's a place in Jamaica called Ochos Rios where eight rivers come together. And there's so much beautiful drinking water that I've never seen anybody come in during the day or night and steal water. There's so much of it. Now, if people have access to the necessities of life, they do not steal. If people can go to a center like a library and get any book out of the library, you know, before they had the public library, women marched for a public library. And they had rotten eggs thrown at them and they were beaten up and put in jail. Eventually, they got the library in. The reason that people were against the library, if you made books available free, they felt it would threaten the sales of books in bookstores. But when people read a little book, a little bit, they bought more books than ever, because they knew more. So I want to build a camera center in every city where any human being go in and check out any kind of camera, just like the library, and any musical instrument. This is love of your country and love of the American people. If they can have access to their needs. But a family, some of them are not educated, 
They don't know how to feed their children. They feed them junk food, not because they're bad parents. They just don't know a failure of education. In schools, you should learn how to relate to one another, how to bridge the difference, how to have a different opinion than your best friend and yet not get angry. This is what the future is about. Learning how to share ideas, not ego. Ego is one of the major problems in the world today. Hey, I did this. I can run faster than you. My daddy can beat your daddy. Or I can ride a bike faster and further. That's the ego. When you learn to share ideas, you enhance everyone. When you keep it to yourself, you remain a stupid individual. Now somebody said, well, some people born with better brains than others, meaning the brain tissue, there's more neurotransmitters. If your brain is better than anybody else's, you become a Nazi faster than a Nazi culture. A good brain has no mechanism of discrimination except experience. Like if you, if you smell a rose, some young lady, and you like it, the next time you see something that looks like a rose, if it got spots on it, black spots, you have a tendency to go. And if it burns your nose for three days and your eyes for three days, the next flower you see of different pattern, you're going to hold it over here and go, you're not going to do this. So they say you've learned. No, no. Your behavior was modified by the pain. Learn is a lousy word designed a long time ago. And we still use those words today. I'll see you at sunup. The sun doesn't come up. The earth rotates in that direction. Remember, our language was designed hundreds of years ago. That makes it almost impossible for us to talk to one another. We talk at each other. Hey, how are you? Nice day. Good to see you. If he says, I'm not too well, I need $2,000 for an operation, can you give it to me? I say, no. Then why do you ask me how I am? What kind of a phony are you? So all this stuff, good morning, how are you, glad to see you, how are the children, all bullshit. Unless you have hospitals, health care for everybody, and everybody is well off. So the doctors don't have to work 18 hours a day, or 10 hours a day. They should work four hours a day. And when a new machine comes into a factory, the boss doesn't walk home saying, now you work four hours a day, you get a little more pay, and a month vacation. He downsizes. He doesn't need you anymore, because the machine does the job. That's why people get mad at machines. They don't serve people. I never read of a machine that had 50 other laptops. They don't say, we'll get you. If it isn't this week, <laughs> next week, or three weeks, they don't care. Machines have no ambition, and Hollywood tells you the machine's going to take over. No machine ever says, gee, I'd like to, I'd like to run the lives of people. Machines don't have a gut reaction. They don't get hungry. They don't feel resentment. If you put one computer and paint it, the other doesn't say, why don't you paint me? You know, they don't get mad. These Hollywood makes movies on the future where people use laser beams and they burn each other. This isn't the future. This is a Hollywood hacks. Now, the book 1984, Brave New World, Atlas Shrugged, that's what you got now. OK? Now, look, let me open this area here to some questions, which I'm sure you all don't agree. So don't be polite. The things you don't understand, if you feel you disagree, please raise your hand. Yes. Um, and speak up, because I can't hear you. Okay. Oh, um, in, in watching the movie and in hearing your lecture, um, your description of the future, it, it sounds amazing. My The thing that I don't understand is the transition from where we are now to get there, because it seems like when you, when, especially when you speak about World War II and like all the money that we spent on the war could have built hospitals in the slums, but like if if you look at the Nazis not being taken out in World War II, then what would Europe look like? And it's it's essentially, your question: How do we get from here to there? <coughs> right. Yeah. That's essentially it. Okay. Yes. First of all, we have to have a crash. That's what makes people think. If they lose their jobs, lose their homes. Other than that, they don't give a damn. As long as you're eating, paying your rent, it's okay. So the system is crashing all over the world, the monetary system. It's going down the hill. And it takes those conditions. If you don't understand that, it was the last depression. I have to tell you this. When I was a kid, a lot of people made down payments 
on automobiles, homes, campers, and the banks fail. I think some of you may know that. How many of you know that? But the banks fail, they couldn't pay off their homes. And the bank said, you got three weeks and you're out unless you make a payment. Well, they couldn't. So they were kicked out. And 15 million Americans, when I was a kid, were sleeping in every empty lot. And that looked wrong to me, because a lot of you guys never saw that. I'm 93, so you know that what I'm talking about is, is in my time, maybe not your time. And I saw all these people sleeping in empty lots. Then something new happened. About 10 to 15 to 30,000 veterans marched on Washington, veterans of World War I. They were promised $600 when you get out of the Army to start life anew. But the government was not in a position then to give them that money. So I gave my IOUs. And the veterans said, I can't pay my rent with IOU. I can't buy food for my kids. And they came with crutches and wheelchairs and were sleeping all around the Capitol in Washington. And that looked very bad. So they said, Douglas MacArthur, who was a captain, get them out of here. It doesn't look good. So he asked them to leave, and they didn't leave. They said, no, we're not leaving until we get our pension you promised us. So Douglas MacArthur ordered the troops to throw tear gas at the veterans. You can look it up in any, particularly the new American history. It isn't in our school books. A lot of stuff is taken out of books, and that is a lie to do things like that. The book, A Hundred Million Guinea Pigs, is a lie. I mean, if you, if you don't make it available to people, books that are taken out of the library because they don't feel you ought to know that, or would hurt the country, I don't like that at all. Yes? All right, we get back now to the transition. The transition is the breakdown first. During the breakdown, during the Depression, there were people up on soapboxes all over America, every empty lot. One group was Mankind United. Another group was called, uh, well, this group was the Church of God. And there was back to family values, socialism, communism, Nazism, all kinds of ideas during the Depression. That's what generated it. So I was standing in front of a socialist, and uh, I said, when you get into power, how are you going to house the masses? Well, I said, well, we'll work that out at that time. I said, well, do you have any blueprints now for it? He said, no. Then I went over to another guy who was talking about communism. He said, go away, Sunday boy. There's a lot of older people there. And I said, no, I want to hear what communism is from a communist. He said, why? Because I don't believe what the Democrats say about the Republicans or what the Republicans say about the communists. I want to hear what the communists have to say. So as you can say. So when he got through, I said, I want to ask you a thousand questions. He said to me, you'll have to go to the YCL. I said, what's that? Young Communist League. I said, what are they? He said, well, here's an address. And I went there. And there were little girls, 10 years old, and boys up to about 17. And they were reading books like Crime and Punishment. Little kids reading deep books. And I said, gee, these kids are very different than ordinary kids. So after the meeting, I raised my hand and I said, uh, how are you going to house the masses? And they said, well, when that time comes, we'll work on it. I said, uh, how are you going to prevent corruption in government? They said, well, we'll work on that when that time comes. I said, let's start a technical branch of the Communist Party, ways of preventing corruption and housing people. They said, you're a deviationist. I said, what, what does that mean? You're deviating from the teachings of Karl Marx. I said, I'm trying to help. I would help anybody, by the way. I don't care what country it is. And they said, you're deviating from the teachings of Marx. And they said, you'll have to leave. <laughs> so the vice president of the Young Communist League got home and said, let's hear him out. And they kicked us both out. That was my experience with the Communist Party. I really did want to help any country. I would help any country. I don't care what their philosophy is. It's not working. So I was interested. In the transition, there'll be a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, because the old ideas are going to clash with the new ones. And if enough people understand the Venus Project, look it up on your website, thevenusproject.com. Look it up. 
There's all kinds of questions that thousands of people ask, and we answer all those questions, and uh, it's not an elitist, it's not technology, technology in charge of people, it's a method of social operation that brings out the best in all human beings, whatever that may be. Yes, sir. You have a question right there? Yes. It sounds like you let me have it. it sounds like your plan really is a communist approach in that you want a central form of government, which you a central form of governance by with, with technology, by computers, correct? Now I I have, I have a fear of the central government in that regard without any kind of checks and balances. I mean, there has to be somebody to maintain the machine that does the governance. And then that, if, if that's so, then those people that do the maintaining have influence over the machine and therefore can affect it according to their personal interests. Then the machine itself, if you do have artificial intelligence that develops to the levels that you're, you're claiming that they can and their potential, what's to prevent a machine from going to the level of, say, a cybernet like in the Terminator? Take and over. I know, I know the that machine take over. Yeah. And before okay. before you answer that, I'd like to mention. Yes, a, a machine is not motivated by chemical impulses like a human being, which gives you an idea that it's going to have a, 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 a straightforward empirical approach, and that's a nice idea. But we do hold as humans values that a machine could not appreciate, such as the idea of keeping mentally disabled people alive. You know, if you think about the terms of eugenics and such, there are scientific approaches to communities that we don't agree with on a personal level because we don't think that everyone should die simply because they're not as useful to the community as the greatest contributors. We, I mean, we don't mean discrimination to... based on health, discrimination based on, based on mental ability. Correct. I mean, okay. In the jungle, I'm trying to answer. Okay. Uh, where areas exist where we don't have good fertile land, we can grow things hydroponically without <laughs> soil. There are areas in the ocean where we can lower supported units that can grow food that's edible for people in the ocean. There are many edible plants. There's really no shortage. So only if there were severe shortages would that happen. Now they're letting out people from prison because they can't afford to feed them. So they're letting out a lot of people that they consider, you know, a smoky pot or something that is not too dangerous. But later on, they will run out of more and more money and more and more criminals will be let out. And there's more and more crime being committed now due to scarcity. So in our system, we try to provide for all people because you can go blind and you can develop cystic fibrosis or you can develop heart disease. So we give every research lab whatever the hell they need. No more digging up nickels and dimes for research in medicine or this disease or that. We have the resources to give every research lab whatever they need. That's why you're always seeing medical people appealing for money for research. That is not a sane society. Look at all the money we spend on battleships, on warplanes, costing billions of dollars. Why don't they spend that money on medical research? What are you trying to dig up nickels and dimes for? No, no, you still have difficulty. If you took the North Pole and the South Pole, and you took all the surplus foods that nations grow, and put it there, stored it, in case of an earthquake in Japan, Hong Kong, or anywhere, we'd have lots of food to go around instead of going to your school and say, can you bring in a box of oatmeal and you a can of tomatoes left for the poor Japanese? We would have that built in. They say, well, what about automobile accidents? Automobile accidents are technical negligence. We got gadgets today that I think most of you have seen. You walk up to your garage and the light goes on. The same kind of unit in an automobile. So I couldn't hit your car even if I wanted to. When I got within 40 feet, the brakes would go on. So they say, well, what about children crossing at school? Well, we have a section of pavement. When a kid presses a button to cross, the pavement turns up like that. So no car can hit a kid. That's the way we say we care. Our problems are not political, they're technical. If you still don't understand that, when I was a kid, well, you're going to have to look this up if you don't believe me, trolley cars used to have a platform. And when you got in, the seats ran all the way through. 
And when people were late for work, they'd climb on the platform, hang on. And they were hit by cars. So they painted a big sign, please, get in the car, but don't hang on the platform. But people that were late for work still were hanging on the platform. So the conductor had a rubber hose in the car or off the platform. Once the car started moving, he got in. And the guys hung on the platform. That went on for 10 years until the car company went to an engineering firm. An engineering firm says, what, what do you want? We don't want people hanging on the platform. Good. They retracted the platform when you got in the car. Just turns out that's the end of the problem. Most problems are technical, not political. Politicians have no idea of how to solve problems. And it's very easy to bridge the difference between nations if you don't attack them. But when I went to the first Klan meetings, and the guy says to me, you're a smart guy, what do you think of the Ku Klux Klan? I said, it was a great organization, but it didn't go far enough. That causes, what do you mean? Then you can talk to them. But if you attack, you lose it. You understand? So reason and logic is strictly bullshit. It doesn't work on people. When I brought a Japanese kid home one day, my mother said, I don't want that kind around. Loud enough for the kid to hear it. He said, so long, God. And I said, boy, if you can't get the blood of your mother, how are you going to change the world? So I said, I just use reason and logic. My mother, no way. I don't want that kind around. Let me tell you what happened. Until I told my mother a story <clears throat> that I was swimming in the East River and I couldn't get ashore, and Masato threw a life raft to me. This is not true. Right. Masato, the Japanese kid, my mother said, You mean he saved your life? I said, yeah. She said, Oh my God, I heard his feeling. Said, yes, you did. She said, But I didn't know he saved your life. Well, now you do. Please, Jock, ask him to come back. I want to beg forgiveness. Ask him to come to dinner Friday. I want to ask him and tell him how sorry I am. I said to her, I don't know if you'll come back now to get her to plead with me more. And here she was pleading, please, John, ask him to come back. No, I told Masato, when you come in the door, my mother's gonna hug you and kiss you, because this is normal to my mother's background. That's why when her first said to me, do you believe in love, do you love your mother? I said, in what area? In the area of racism, she was a racist, and, and she was antagonistic to foreigners. So I did not love her in that area. That's why I try to tell people that love is another bullshit word. Now let me tell you what I mean by that so you don't get mad at me. Is there anybody here that likes everything they've ever done? Okay, so we all do stupid things in the past. We do things we didn't like. Now if you live with a replica of yourself, how long will you be together? So sometimes you love yourself, sometimes you don't. So if you fall in love with a guy and the guy falls in love with a girl, you're married a few years, sometimes you love him, sometimes you don't love him as much, sometimes you just don't like him, and sometimes you love him again. So it's a fluctuating thing, not a fixed thing. Do you understand that? You don't love yourself all the time any more than you can love anyone else all the time. So once you understand that, before that, people used to get confused. Some girl told me she sent her boyfriend through medical school. And when he got out, he ran off with her best friend. She said, what a terrible person he is. I said, no, there's nothing wrong with that guy. Your ability to judge people is poor. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the world you live in. When you think it should be a certain way it isn't, you get mad. It's your own values that allow stuff, not the world. If you invite a guy or a person into your home that has no place to live, no place to sleep, and you're a good Christian, and they steal a lot of stuff and leave, you say, that lousy son of a bitch, it's you that have poor judgment. So we have to learn how to look at the world honestly. And in that way, we can arrive at better conclusions. You had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, address um, what this gentleman was saying earlier and stuff. Um, just like, we're, as long as it's people trying to figure out society that to live in, someone's always going to have to make some sort of consensus that people should follow by and stuff. But the thing is, is that if you're living in a free society, uh, all education, all knowledge, all, like as many like information that you can put into your brain is going to be available. So if like you don't want to learn something, and let's, well, let's say someone does build a machine 
and this machine it turns out to be detrimental to the society and stuff, well then you have the opportunity to say, wait, I can prove that this machine is detrimental and stuff. And that way you can go and you can show them. If you can prove it, everyone else is going to say, wow, you're right. We need to do away with this and change it or make whatever change that can be necessary. But if you, if, you, if you offer everyone that same education and the same chance to get it, like, like everyone's going to be empowered, not just one particular. One particular person might come up with a really good idea and it might work. And, it, and, and that would be great, but if, if someone found a flaw in it, they can always address that, show that to the public. What is your question? Like your oh, I, I, just, I just want to adjust what he I was saying earlier and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, you asked like six or seven I know, questions. I mean, that was yeah. I apologize. But I, I guess and it went to a simple question. I mean, how do we try and prevent corruption? Can you override the machines? Is that what you want to know? Well, well the machines do not control people. Yeah. Just production of this machine of materials and deliver that to the supermarkets. It does not control people. Absolutely. That, that, that's the thing about machines and stuff like that. Like, like I'm a computer programmer, so I understand like how machines, you know, get that data and stuff. So like, like again, like you can always, as long as you, like, like, like there's no computer program that can ever come past me that I can say, oh well, this is busted and stuff like that. Let me, I can show you where it's busted and how it you can fix it and stuff like that. I know it's proven and stuff. So, and so like, in a society like that, everybody becomes a critic in a sense where they can always like look and say, okay, well this is messed up and I can. I can fix this and show it to people and stuff. That's why I think this is such a great uh, uh, idea. Machines like, as or, decision makers, would okay. they override people? Machines as decision makers? How would they well, make decisions? Like how? Yeah, well, I mean, machine, machines can be overridden and stuff, but it's through people. But like a machine I will can't answer that. I think I know what you want to know. Today, the United States Army, I want to tell you about the old days before, a pilot used to look out at the airplane and say I'm about a mile high. Today they have Doppler radar. Tells exactly how high you are, how many feet, inches off the ground. No human can do that. About nine months ago, computers were able to handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. No group of humans can do that. So humans are on their way out in terms of the ability to sense things just because they can. They can. You can't see electrons, but with an electron microscope, it extends the human attributes. So there's nothing the matter with machines. Somebody had a question before you, back there. All right. Well, I was just, just question, I was Oh, yes. Say, I was just like a yes. I think what, what, what I was trying to get from you is, what if the programmer is corrupt? What if the guy who makes the, who makes the, exactly. um, the doctor the radar is corrupt? and he programs the machines to jam other machines. First of all, you've got to understand there's nothing to gain in a non-monetary system. If I pay you 50,000 to cause a jam in computers, he does it. But in a system that doesn't use money, nobody gets paid off. You can't sell drugs, you can't open a house of prostitution, you can't have gambling, you can't import stuff to the country, and you can't pay off senators. Only if you do away with money. As long as you got money, I don't care who you were like, it'll go corrupt. Yes, sir. Well, uh, what I'm hearing the, the few gentlemen say is basically, how could you trust a machine when it's the human that's actually created that machine? Very good. Pulling those strings? How can you trust a machine since it really doesn't care about people, it doesn't have any feelings? If humans are programming the machines, how do you trust the machine? I don't have to do that. Oh, sorry, I thought you didn't. When humans used to operate elevators, I don't know if anybody remembers that, they never quite got to the floor. They were always moving around like that. <laughs> now you press 18, it takes you there almost all the time. So you really have machine failure today. They have production lines where automobiles are assembled by machine. The doors, the wheels are put on. Sure, it breaks down, but not nearly as much as humans do. So, the machines are programmed to turn on automobiles, right? And they do a better job, faster, and they check it out and everything. So, if you have supermarkets, whereas you remove goods from the supermarket, the supermarket's computers will order stuff instead of somebody with a pencil paper taking inventory. You don't need that. So, what we do is shorten the workday for everybody. Instead of two-week vacation, you get a month vacation. We produce a lot of sailboats for your use. Here's a negative aspect. Nobody owns anything in the future. You have to do away with ownership 
you don't own your wife. No guy owns his wife and orders her around. She's an independent person, makes her own decisions. No more anyone controlling you. There's no subservience, no debt, no money loaned at interest. You understand what I'm saying? Only in that way. Anything less than that will not work. Yes. Um, well, let me get to that guy right here. Ever since the beginning of time and man, there has been an exchange for something. If you're proposing a non-monetary system, then how do you, you know, how do people then get an incentive to do something else? What incentive is there for them if there's no money? There is an incentive group called Doctors Without Borders. How many have ever heard of it? They work for nothing. They, they, their sense of well-being is helping people. And Martin Luther King wasn't promised 5,000 bucks if he marched into the South. He did it because he believed in it. Jesus, Mahatma Gandhi worked for nothing. Nobody ever promised him anything. If you did this, I'll give you a house in the country. Nothing like that. So everything great came about without money. Now, if they tell you that money generates incentive, it also generates incentive for embezzlement, corruption, paying off your brother-in-law. You know what I mean? It generates all kinds of incentives. And you had a question, sir. Yes. Um, everybody's kind of interested in the, the, the situation with the computers. And what it keeps coming back to me, it, voting machines are a good example of this. Um, it, even if the society has been, we've been, say we've been using paper ballots to a certain point, and society was sort of, sort of free in a sense that, that we were all having a say in what was going on around us. Now we have computers and we know from the 2000 election, at least a lot of us know, those computers were tampered with. And the people that were helping, that we were electing to help make decisions within our society, they wanted their opportunity to take everything and make their decisions over all of us. How do we keep that kind of corruption from creeping back in we when a road when a road computer program the is with the doesn't advocate People in government, machines, we have a machine government. I don't let that scare you. Let me tell you what it means. The uh, agricultural department machines go into the soil. The mic. The so mic. if the water table drops, that pumps water out there. If the nutrients change, the machine pumps nutrients out there. You don't need a guy there anymore. You don't need a guy to tell the president we're having a terrible flood in this area. And the president says, how bad is it? He says, well, there's 5,000 homeless. In the next few days, there may be 15,000. So the president gets in an airplane, and he flies over, and he says, yes, you do have a flood. So what? We want to build flood control systems to take the flood waters, divert them to storage areas, not have a president fly over, say, you have a drought, we have this or that. That isn't the answer. Politics is nothing. Because in fact, the kids of the future will say to you, Dad, couldn't you see that politics was corrupt, basically? There that the whole be, money system, the banking system? Yes. There wouldn't be people in positions of differential advantage. They do that type of behavior today because there's something to gain from it. But if you have a society where everybody has access to things, there's no basis of corruption. There, in the terms that you're thinking about it, you're trying to think about it in today's society. You're thinking about it in terms of the movies that people give you no, and extrapolating no, no, a free you're, enterprise system into the machine no, I'm society. No, you're superimposing what I'm thinking. What I'm okay, thinking is, in, 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 in the light of something, I, I saw some quotes from Krish Minerdi in the event of Krish Minerdi. His whole point was you have to be a light unto yourself and not depend on others. And when he taught this to everything, the first thing they wanted to do was make him the next messiah. It's human nature. How do we get away from that? Okay. First of all, I want to tell you that every book today in modern psychology says that there's no such thing as human nature. There's human behavior. Now, when I went to the South Seas, I'm going to tell you what happened. All the natives on Tuamotu when I was 21 walked around completely nude. And I never saw a native stare at a female body that was brought up there. He was swimming nude ever since he was this high. 
and they always looked at the eyes of a girl, never the body. But here in America, the camera moves in on the cleavage line where the girl leans forward. Then it covers her legs. Then it covers her butt when she's walking. That's where the guys get that from. Hey, get a load of that chick. And women say, well, you know how men are. That isn't how men are. That's how they're made in this culture. But in the South Pacific, where all the girls walked around nude, you couldn't, no one collected pictures of nude women. They were brought up that way. Now, if you took your grandmother to Miami Beach, and she saw the girls walk around with their butts hanging out, they've gone too far. And where she's coming from, she's right, but not right for this period in time. Do you understand what I mean? Your grandmother brings with her her conventional views of her time. So you can't take people that are obsolete and take them right out and put them in a new world. You have to orient them that. So we talk of environment only as a major factor. The geneticists today are looking for the gay gene. Some are looking for the democratic gene. Can you beat that? How stupid can you be? When it's obvious that if a black man or a white man or the son of a Klansman is brought up by a black family, he's going to walk and talk like a black man. If you take a black man and bring him up in England, and, and he'll speak with an Oxford accent. If you take a black man and bring him up in Germany, he says, Deutschland over alles, just like a German. There's no such thing as innate black behavior or that men are basically greedy. All that's bullshit, you get that in your culture because you're given the blame in this culture. And the reason marriage was set up, if you were around screwing 50 women, they wouldn't know who the babies belong to. So when you get married in the community, they all know you're responsible for the babies from that young lady you're with. So marriage was an institution to save the kings and the noblemen from supporting your kids. It's a bullshit profession. And then if you don't get along, by the way, the lawyer says he costs you 2,000 bucks and split it up. Who the hell is he? How does he come up with that? If you don't like the guy, why can't you walk out? The lawyer says you've got to go through this procedure. And then this guy with a white collar that pronounces your man and wife. Who the hell is he? How can he pronounce your man and wife? And in the Bible, it says two people that really love each other, no one can put us under. If you really like a person, your parent says, I don't want you going with that guy, you don't give a damn. Okay. You have another question? Yeah. Um, in the examples you gave about um, like some, uh, how people used to work in elevators and then um, machines assembling things, uh, automobiles on assembly lines, um, with more technology, that's going to become more prominent and there's going to be, you know, if machines are better at doing things than humans, then they're going to do them and not humans. So what are humans supposed to do? First of all, I know a guy, a little guy, the designer, and they say to me, can a machine be better than the guy that designed it? This little guy designed a machine to pick up a freight train and empty it. He can't do that. The guys that design machines that move coke bottles along, he can't move them that fast. Machines are always faster than the designer. So your question, what will people do? What will people do? There'll be art centers, music centers, produce plays, write concerts, travel, sail, scuba dive. We saw the reefs, invent things. Every soldier will be sent back to school to become a social innovator, a person that works on problem solving. What a wonderful <coughs> world we would have if we had soldiers that worked on problem solving. Do you understand what I'm saying? The profession of soldiers are nothing. A police officer, the generally, I hope there's some police officers here, is a nothing profession. We can design cars today. When you get to a 60 mile an hour zone, the power output is 60 miles an hour. You can step on the gas till you're blue in the face, and it won't go any faster. We can design things today so you don't need laws. All 90% of man made laws are strictly bullshit. The only laws that count, by the way, is a natural law. If you don't get enough sleep, nutritious food, you get sick, no matter what your philosophy is. But religion is one of the major con conflict generators because it tells you such a thing as right and wrong, good and bad. 
That depends on the culture. I think judges would be considered criminals in the future. I think that lawyers in the future would be considered criminals. So a lot of things you call right today, a young man flying in an airplane, presses a button and drops napalm over a village, you call him a war hero. We call him criminals. But they don't. You know what the old definition of a criminal was? One who removes an object from your possession without your permission. They've changed that definition. Today, it's one who's caught. That's better, isn't it? <laughs> so Washington is loaded with them, as you see on your news bill. And the other question. Yes, you back there. Uh, you talked about uh, how, like, like the new history books and stuff like that, how we tend to keep things hidden that maybe we don't want to hear, you know, maybe war crimes that people, you know, Americans in general in the past have committed. So um, it's sort of like censorship, I guess. How would you, you know, present information that's previously censored to people who don't really want to see it because you're angry? Like, I, I believe in the whole thing that ignorance is bliss. How would you? You know, get rid of censorship and bring everything to the forefront, and still, if people don't want to see that, how would you, you know, sort of force that upon them? Censorship should be done away with. How would you get people to look at that information that they're not? First of all, I don't know what you mean by censorship. In the future, you can read anything you want to read, but you can't hurt anybody. If you hurt them, you're help. You're not put in prison. Okay. We don't have any need for censorship. If, if, say, one guy wants to build an airplane with a swept forward wing, another guy wants to build with swept back, who decides? We build swept forward, swept back. We can't. We don't have to worry about how much will it cost. We have the resources. See, so you're permitted to try anything. If you want to try to make a, a pill that increases the oxygen in your blood, so you can swim underwater for an hour and a half. You're not allowed to give it to your son, but you can try it on yourself. Is that all right? I, I think he was asking if you if you don't have censorship, how you how do you keep let's say information that a person doesn't want away from them? I wouldn't know what what, what information a person. Let's just say, for example, you don't want to see pornography. So let's say, for example, a person does not want to see what we now call pornography. And you have no censorship. So the assumption is that that pornography... I didn't will... say we don't have no censorship. Somebody else said that. Okay. We well, do I, mean, I was just trying to explain his question. We educated. We educate children to be able to relate to one another, to speak, communicate with a referential <laughs> language. That means... Today, I believe most of you have been brought up to believe that everyone should have a right to their own opinion. Isn't that true? Most of you? Okay. Let's say you live across the street from me, and I see 10 guys coming out of your apartment. I can have all kinds of opinions, right? You can be a language instructor, a ballet instructor, but if you give everybody the right to their own opinion, you're generating a lot of new problems. I would make things available to people. Anything they want to know, we tell them where to look it up. Like the internet, you can find out a great many things. So let people have access to information, what they call transparency. Then there's no need for hurting people. There'd be no prisons in our society, no police, no armies, no navies, no authority that you have to answer to. We build sailboats for your use. You don't have to come up to Fresco and say, can I use a sailboat this Sunday? I say, there's 50 people before you. We build more than required. So you can take it out yourself. The only difference is your sailboat is monitored by satellite. In case there's fire at sea, we know where to go to get you. Not Big Brother watching you. I'm talking about safety for your own good. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no need to hurt anyone. You're going to need population control to make sure that the resources are never exceeded. I couldn't get that. You have to have population control so that it doesn't exceed the resources. Well, when you use the term population control, that scares people. We do a survey of what the carrying capacity of the Earth is, and that tells us how many people the Earth can support. If you exceed that, 
You're going to have malnutrition, disease, and territorial disputes. Do you understand that? Yes. So many acres can support so many people. If you put more than what the ground can support, you're going to have disease, malnutrition, and problems. So how do you make sure that you don't exceed the limits of the resources? Well, the survey committee tells us what, how many hospitals we need. Educate people. They have to be educated. You have to educate people. Right, well, educate people is to stop people from producing people. We show them a film called Dynamic Equilibrium in Nature. If you produce more people than land can support, these are the problems you're going to have. Now, if they don't seem to understand that, that's another problem. There's a lot of ways of birth control. Right. You're talking about people who don't right. understand dynamic yeah. equilibrium? Not, there's a lot you, know, of you can't plant millions of flowers in a given area, the soil will be exhausted. Exactly. So you have to have a Department of Agriculture that says, here's how you can grow more flowers. This is what we call soil additive. Right. It takes a thousand years to make one inch of topsoil. And the jackasses today build new cities right over it. We would shave the topsoil, put it in soil banks, because we know differently than the old people that used to build right over things. Today, they build a dam to generate power. But fish can't get back to the spawning grounds when you build a dam. So all our dams have stepped areas where the fish can get back up to the spawning grounds. You know what I mean? I mean total planning. Today, we design a dam to produce electricity. In the future, it's an overview. Do you understand the difference? There's no profit in it for anyone but everyone. Yeah. My question is, the population today is increasing exponentially. Yes. Okay. I expect it's going to continue that way. Until? Until, until, until the system collapses. Until the system collapses or, I mean, as long as there's access. We to hope to get this film out before the system hits total collapse. If we don't, it'll revert back. But aren't I you saying no that you need the collapse in order to have the transition? More than now. If enough people Look into the Venus project. Find out what it's about. You'll find no one gets hurt. We don't want to kill capitalists, communists, anybody. They're all victims of culture. There's no prisons, no police. If you understand what I'm talking about, talk to your friends about it. Look, the Venus project is not perfect. It's just a hell of a lot better than the system today. And it'll get better. And there are no final frontiers, no utopias, no best buildings, no best laptops. Every year they'll change to get better. It's called an emergent society. Today we have an established society. It's fixed and it operates according to certain laws. In the future, all societies will be command and tell us how to improve chairs and everything else. Use the mic. I don't know if they can hear you in the back. Okay. Can you hear me back there? We need an emergent society, not an established society, where nothing remains constant. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, my question is, do you advocate the uh, abolition of forms of punishment in raising children? You're saying you spare the rats, pull the child. I advocate punishment in would you advocate, educating ad children. Is that would you advocate question? the yeah the abolition of punishment? Punishment in educating children. Well, let me tell you how we educate children. We do not order them to do exercise. We have a big lake in the city, and we have an island in the middle of the lake, 200 feet up with a crab shop where you can make anything free. To get there, you've got to roll a boat. You've got to climb the hill. So let's design it in our environment. So you go to the library, you have to climb a hill, walk through the forest, and, and reach in different directions. That's the way you do it. You don't order kids to stand out there. If you hate exercise, you poison yourself. You know that? So kids would have the motivation to go to the craft shop. You build it in. That's the way nature works. When a fox sees a, a porcupine, doesn't know what it is, it gets closer and closer until it gets stuck. And later on, stays away from porcupines. It's the greatest teacher in the world. Yes. Yes, I wanted to know what type of procedures or pro protocols would this project go through if people were to rebel? Because it seems as if this is sort of uh, a culture or some sort of land that for the good of the good. Like it seems like if someone wanted to become a dictatorship, I mean, a big, become a dictator, 
they could if they just somehow get to the machines. Okay. What if a corrupt person wanted to become a dictator <coughs> and take over the system? <coughs> Uh, let me say this. First of all, everybody lives well. There are no poor, no hungry people. So any, if you want to take over, what are you taking over? You live in a nice house. You, have, you don't own anything in the future. You have access to anything like a public library, a television camera, anything you want. It's there for your use. The concept of ownership was good 50 or 100 years ago. Free enterprise is terrific 150 years ago. But today, we have the capability to produce an abundance. Go, go look at your shopping center. We can produce everything you need. You don't have to charge people anymore. But I want to tell you where I got the ideas. This may help you. Wait, can I, I got well, it. No, no, no. Let me just answer that. During, they, they think that Hitler Way, you know, they say that Hitler swayed Germany. Well, he couldn't have done that. A dictator couldn't have taken over unless the people in Germany had that value system to begin with. When you have an educated populace, in, in not just in, in certain areas, but in a broad range, being a multidisciplinarian, knowing a lot about a lot of subjects, you can't have somebody come up and dictate what they're going to do. They, but, but they, they, would be helped. they would be helped rather but than have that ability to sway people. I understand because uh, I just see this in some sort of way that there are going to have to be human labor in some sort of way because if someone was to get a hold of the machines, then they have a hold of your resources. <coughs> they have that machine that makes your food. So if, you, if I have the control of the machine that makes your food and you don't eat, that means you build me a castle. I want my house to be bigger than yours. If you have access to everything you need, all the food, health care, why do you want to do that? Is there something wrong with the guy's head, you mean? Could be. If there is, he's then help. He's not put in prison. We do that with our automobiles and airplanes. Human Your airplane has a tendency. Because humans have always lived in scarcity. There's no such thing as human nature. There's human behavior. And that's what I said, human behavior. It's you always been changed because they've lived in the same deprivation and differential advantage. If you change the environment, you'll get a different behavior. But who's to change the environment? Who's the one to set that standard to change you. the environment? Uh, you uh, understand yeah. what I'm talking about. And if you agree that behavior is shaped by culture, <laughs> if you were brought up in the South, you speak with a Southern accent, do you buy that? I, you never I saw believe that, that is a, is, is what do you mean by human nature? Our views of I'm not saying human nature. I'm saying human behavior, and I said that from the beginning. It's human behavior that always wants to go better and be on top. Mm -hmm. Who is going to set the standard? Okay. Whoever sets the standard, no one whoever sets set the standard, standard though, is right. the one who's in control. That's just you do that for your life, though. You see that? That's just that's 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 why does anyone that's want that's to be at the top? Is that an ego problem? You think? Or why does anyone want to be over another person? I'd rather work with people than over them. If I meet a person that knows less about aircraft, say, I work on aircraft safety devices, and they said in the old days that you can't take a plane out of a flat spin. So I designed wingtips that turn into the spin and took it out. So you learn how to say, I don't know how to take a plane out of a flat spin. You'll, say, you'll never be able to take a plane. That language in itself is an ego. Just to say, look, they asked scientists, can you put a man on the moon? And do you know what they said? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? But well, we don't know what man can stand. They said, what do you mean by that? We have to put him in a centrifuge and see where he conks out at nine Gs, nine gravities, or six gravities. That means you can't shoot a rocket ship off too fast because the people will die. That's what I mean, I don't know. So they put a guy in a rotor. Then they said, we don't know how to give a guy water in outer space. <coughs> what do you mean? You don't know. Give him a glass of water. If you pull the glass away, the water would remain there and go off in bubbles. So you can't give a guy a glass of water. So you have to put water in like a toothpaste tube and squeeze it 
and drink. <laughs> That's what man says, I don't know. That's the most difficult people for people to learn, I don't know. There are guys today that say, we'll never get to Mars, not in a thousand years. You think that they didn't make studies of it? No, just their stinking opinion. Just say, I don't know, it's not my field, I don't even know how rockets work. That's honesty. So we say, listen, there's always been automobile accident, and you'll always have automobile accident. Well, this is a pinhead that's not an innovator. But if you're an innovator, there's nothing you don't feel that can be conquered. Yes. Um, you're saying that you're, you're wondering why, that like, how it's not going to be that somebody <coughs> is going to want to be bigger and want to be better and want to dominate. But in the world we live in, and the way the world has always been, we have classes of society. We have the upper class, the middle class, the lower class. In a real society, just living on Earth with the Earth, what do you need to be better than? You're not trying to prove anything to anyone. You're just living your life on Earth in an equal society. There is no need to be better than something because there's no levels of goodness. You know what I mean? There's no middle, upper, higher. There's just life and living. You don't need to be better than anything. Why would you want to? But, just but, 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 that's, but that's the behavior of a human body. Like, you just can't take like a pure bullshit or behavior. Even if that is true, cannot take that physically out of a human body. You can't take that behavior out of a I've never experienced that behavior. Someone's always going to want to be better than someone else. Don't do it. Human competition. If you're brought up in a competitive environment, like I can run faster than you. Oh yeah? Oh yeah, we run. So if I do run faster, does that make me better than you? Now people do that because they get little recognition. Now you're going to have to take my word for this because I haven't seen this today. But when I was a kid, people used to sit on a telephone pole for a week to break the record. Did you ever hear of that, anybody? <laughs> Why do they do that? Because they're trying to say, look at me, goddammit, I exist. Very few people get recognition today. So you say, that was a nice thing you did. But most people don't get recognition, so they stand on their hands for four hours or to get recognition. This is the illness of our society. Every kid should be rewarded. Every kid should be encouraged to take steps forward. So what I'm hearing is that ultimately for this thing to work, speak up. Ultimately what I'm hearing for this thing to work is that the human condition has to be completely so to get this thing to work, the human condition has to be removed. Like whether, whether you're in a specific culture, whether you're in a different society, the problem is that there's always a need to thrive or to excel. To excel, like whether whether everybody is given the same opportunities, the same goals. Kids are given credit in school. If you do something the way the teacher likes it, you get an A. The person wants something, they get a C. That makes jealousy and that man right away. So in the schools of the future, we encourage every kid to work. In other words, I wish I had a drawing board to show you, but when kids make a terrible drawing, the teacher hangs it up. I never did that. I say the drawing, and they draw people like stick figures, and I say to the kid, does this guy eat anything? Because I made him too skinny. And right away the kid adds mass. Don't let a kid do a childish drawing and don't hang it up. In other words, inform them as to how to improve that. I take four-year-olds and teach them how to draw like 20-year-olds. Because the artist himself has learned to draw over a long period of time and doesn't always know how he does it. He says, I guess I, it's nature. I've been drawing for a long time. But he's a bad communicator. If you still don't understand me, we don't know. A lot of people think that somebody invented language. They say the reason of their life is to communicate. That's not true. What happened? A guy banged his elbow. They went, ah. Oh. Then he banged his knee. Went, oh. Then he ate something with feet. And, oh. and language <laughs> is an extrapolation of all those sounds over many years. Nobody's ever sat down and invented language any more than anybody sat down and invented a wheel, which they tell you in all schools today. Somebody invented the wheel, that was the beginning of the machine age. That's not true. 
when a log fell over another log and the guy pulled it, it rolled. And, ah, oh, that's good. Well, if there's a stone in the way, that stopped the whole thing from turning. So they shaved the bark off, and eventually you had two wheels on the end. But nobody ever sat down and invented anything. That's all bullshit. A person takes an idea so far, another person adds to it, and gradually you get an automobile. But nobody ever sat down when I made an airplane. Well, when you climb a hill, I don't know you, but you look for the slight flats. If you don't step on the flats, you slip. So after you live there 10 years, it looks like steps. I can't hear you it looks like steps. But no, when he moves, he cuts out steps. But he doesn't come to a hill and say, I need steps to get up. That's not possible. Nobody invented the propeller. There are many things that grow on trees that spin down on the ground. I'm sure you've seen it. There's nothing that man ever thought of that was original, including the wireless including Tesla, I can tell you where he got it if you really want to know. Yeah, sure. I can tell you where ideas come from. They don't come from nothing. They don't come from a guy thinking about it, all that bullshit. They don't know. Artists themselves don't know how they do things. So I used to take children and give them a stick and they make zigzag in the sand. And accidentally, that zigzag looked like Abraham Lincoln. So the kids are the same. I said, don't lie to me. You just went like that, and I'd have to go, that's right. You know, everything, kids pick up a pencil, and they make all kinds of lines. If it happens to look like a bird, they put an eye in it. You understand? They're little liars. There's a question on the way back. Yes, sir. You talked about how it would be a really good thing if we had soldiers eventually, you know, working and, and learning and building things that would help the society. How can you get to that point when, at this point in time, in, in the foreseeable future, there's a necessity to protect our way of life? How could you keep and maintain that way of life without having to defend that with force? And other people, for whatever reason, want to destroy that way of life, that you live or that they live. You know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a society. Do you watch the zeitgeist? Do you watch the zeitgeist? Okay. How do you protect this way of life that I'm talking about no, without soldiers? No, this way of life. You're talking about today? How do you protect today's way of life without soldiers? Yeah, I mean, if you want to protect today's way of life without soldiers. Yeah, I mean, okay. soldiers. soldiers represent the establishment, not the majority of people. Police represent the establishment, not the majority of people. If the majority of people did something against the establishment, the police would put them down. The police are the tools and instruments of the establishment. If policemen in the future, if there are any until you transition, if you're driving your car and oscillating a lot, the police officer will say, can I help you in any way? Where are you trying to get to? So I have a terrible headache and I don't know where they'll help you. Now, where did you learn to drive? Let me see your life. These are bullies, not human beings. Like I said, most soldiers are killing machines. They're not even human. And I'm sorry about what I'm saying, but we want to raise human beings on the planet that care for the environment and one another. Anything less than that is not worth saving. Yes. Your website says you have, I think, 21 acres down here in Florida. Mm -hmm. Are you, you, you had land down in Florida, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. Are you trying to go forward with a model of this civilization by making this? Are you it's starting? It's a research this? center. We've done books and videos. We're going to have a TV station there, an internet station. We're training. We're going to be affiliated shortly with universities there, training um, architects and engineers in this new way of thinking. Um, but are you actually trying to build a there. community? Not, not. We, well, we are taking on more people, but for specific things. But we, we do want to expand in another location for the first city. Yeah. we're aiming for. But before that, we'd like to do a movie. We think you really can't take to people of today and move them in a new city and have it much different. We want to do a major motion picture that will go around to the whole world showing life in the future. But every single movie today on the future is detrimental. It's like the free enterprise system extrapolated into the future. And all these restrictions and all these machines killing people, we want to show a positive future to pose a direction for people to work towards, and then we want to do flashbacks of how we get from here to there to help answer questions for people. It's just that it's all 
an ideal. It's a beautiful vision, and I love to see the pictures, and I love the concept, but it's so hard to see how we're going to be able to get there from here without mm -hmm. killing people, without... Did you, were you here when I talk about the Ku Klux Klan? Right. So we want to turn them around. If we are smarter than they are, you don't say, that's a terrible organization you belong to. When the guy says to me, what do you think of the Klan? I say, great organization, but it doesn't go far enough. Then he said, what do you mean? See, so you have to be wise enough not to antagonize people that think differently than you do. I believe that the people here are very sincere when they say you can't change human nature. They mean they're saying that as far as they have ever observed, humans have always been greedy, always committed crimes, no matter what flag they were under. And that's true, because conditions have always been scarce. I don't say they haven't, they always have been scarce. So if you're brought up in a family with seven brothers, and they hand down the clothing to you, from your older brother, you say, Daddy, why did I get used clothing and Billy gets new clothing? He says, because I can't afford to buy every kid new clothing. But when he gets a job, he never wears used clothing. Did you know that? All right, so where did he get it from? Being handed down second-hand clothing. Now, that's, that's true in many instances. And there are even people today that have been, well, uh, let me put it with animals, something you probably didn't know. When an animal cannot get to mother's breast for milk, say she has three, and a little animal that's pushed back by all the other dogs, and they always get pushed back, that dog or wolf or fox always becomes the leader. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? Not one hand. Do you understand what I'm saying? The kid that's pushed back a lot always becomes the leader. Those are the conditions that they find in animal behavior that makes one animal the leader and the others not. Now that's research that they find. They also found out, they felt intuitively, that if you took a Chinese baby, he would learn Chinese faster than an English baby exposed to Chinese. So they tried it out, and they both learned at the same time. You would imagine speaking Chinese for generations. Maybe the baby learned a little bit. No, they did not. So when you put things to test, I worked for the aircraft industry for a long time. And when I was first introduced to it, they used to finish an airplane, and they say that it holds up 25 pounds per square foot. Did you know that they pile sandbags on the wing until it breaks off? And it breaks off at 27 pounds per square foot. They say it's true. My calculations are right. I love that system. Another thing they used to do, when they finished a brand new commercial airliner, they pull it up in the air 25 feet off the ground and cut the cable. Boom! It will fall on the ground, see if the landing gear holds up. I love that system. Better than calculations or anything else. So if I designed a bridge, the only difference is they have webbed feet. Okay? Now, the reason they invented these duplicates, because sometimes the son of an important person commits rape. So he says it was a duplicate people who came up from under the rock. See, they saved a hell of a lot of people in high places that way. I want to tell you about the Salem witch hunts. How many of you know about them? How many of you knew that for every witch you found, you inherited their bank account and property? Did you know that? How many of you knew that? Only four people or five. So there was a good reason for finding witches. I'm sorry, I'm not your enemy. I'm really your friend. I'm trying to tell you about a new way of thinking. You've been exposed to the old way most of your life. You're not about to step into this. We don't know each other that well, but if you look into the Venus Project, you can get answers to lots of detail. I've been working all my life to try to find out if there's anything extra physical because a lot of ministers used to come to my seminars and they said, John, the trouble with you is you don't believe in human nature and you don't believe in anything extra physical. I said, sir, I've never seen anything extra physical. Have you? And they say, yes, take me there. So they took me to a woman that had the power of telekinesis. You know what that is? Moving objects without touching them. And she had 
A bell buzzer under the table with four rubber shock rounds. The table was highly polished, slightly tilted, and a vibratory rate that moved that object down the table. But I've been to thousands of seances. I've been to, brought, we brought people over from India. That this guy said he never used a telephone. He telepathy, all the time telepathy. So I said, all you have to do is read my mind once. Not based on coincidence. Like a, there was an elderly, elderly person, say 70, he says there's been a death in the family. Either three weeks or three, there's always a death in the family when you're 70 years old. So I think he was working on probability. So I said, what if I think of something in the technical field, and you can't use technical language, can you describe the event? He says, yes. I says, great. So I pictured a little white mouse this size. It goes into the zoo and it eats an elephant. It doesn't get any larger and walks on. If he got that, they still have to think. See, that's not, not probability. You had a sister, you think maybe you were. You know what I mean? Everybody has a sister they're thinking of. That is most people. So then he didn't get that. But, well, maybe he, maybe he really has that power, but it didn't work in that instant. So I pictured a wood saw. You know what a carpenter uses? A wood saw with legs. And the wood saw walks into the forest, and the tree looks at the saw, and the tree cuts the saw in half. Now that's outside of the box. And if there's telepathy, he'd have gotten it. Do you understand? But if you think of, I was thinking of my Uncle Harry, you know, some relative you were thinking, is that right? Because, yeah, my Uncle Harry. So those are all within probability. Another time, I had a couple over my home. They claimed they had the power of telepathy. So I said, great, one demonstration is all it needs. So the guy put his wife in my bedroom. I've never seen her before. And I whispered it in his ear, Abraham Lincoln. And his wife came right out and said, you whispered in my husband's ear, Abraham Lincoln. Here's how that works. They work on a posture position. If he's sitting with his arms folded, it's Lincoln. If he's sitting like this, it's Jefferson. If he's sitting like this, it's Cary Grant, the movie actor. You understand? They work out a system that you know nothing about. It's an esoteric language. Although they seem to be talking a normal language, their language has a different communication. Another time a guy came to my lab and he said, John, I can demonstrate telepathy. So that you'll be convinced. I said, shoot. I have no reason not to believe in it. I just would like to see a demonstration. So he said, I want you to call this guy in England. And you whisper from your own pictures of movie actors, take any movie actor, I think I picked Clark Gable years ago, and I said, now call this guy in England. His name was Throckmorton. I called Throckmorton, you see, I see a guy with curly hair, very tall, black hair, and his name is Clark Gable. And I call this guy in England. You wonder how that works. Well, that would convince most people. Here's how it works. He's got a friend in England named Benson. If you ask for Mr. Worthington, it means Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so he's got a list of names. Do you understand that? But if you don't know that, I've heard it with my own ears, people tell me. There is no magic, nothing. No wheels that turn without a connection or a magnetic unit in the wall that turns. There is no magic. Now I read that a mother got up at night I don't know what it was. He said she had a strange feeling and something happened to my son in the war. I know that. And the next day she got a letter from the war department. I'm sure you've heard this. How many people heard this? So I called the war department and I said, is it true? And they said, we get 15,000 letters a day that something happened to my Jimmy and nothing happened. So you hear about the ones that happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no magic. People like to believe in magic because it makes them feel good. They like to believe in the life hereafter. You know, when you kick the bucket and you meet all your relatives. Uh, you know, in, in 20 or 40 or 50 or a thousand years before it changed at your relatives. What do you do in heaven all day long? Sing? <laughs> and the Lord said he put you here to praise him. This is not God. This is a psychopath. I'm trying to tell you, man can't conceive of God. And that's where technology is moving. They're trying to make a God. 
They're trying to make automobiles smart enough to tell you, check your tires, you're lower there. After that, the tire will be checked automatically and air will be pumped into it. Can you understand that? The computer will tell you to shut it off at a certain time. Your automobile, when you get through with it, you get out, it'll go and plug itself in to charge the battery. <coughs> you won't have to do any of that. The future is a fantastic place. Yes? So what do you think does happen to us when we die? We just die and that's... Well, it isn't what I think. If, you, if I die, say, you bury me a foot underground, the plants get very tall, which is, I'm disappearing, and the plants are getting taller, and the worms are getting fatter. The stuff you're made of was always around, because you're made of plants you ate, chicken you eaten, they've always been around. Now, here's what people don't understand. Where did all this come from? That's a big question they ask. Well, if you study science, you'll find out you can take a steel ball, and you can heat it to 20 million degrees. It looks like it's gone, but it's been converted to radiant energy. You can't destroy matter or make matter. It can change it. You can eat carrots, become a little taller. Some of the carrots will make up your hair, your eyes, or anything else. But matter is never created. There's no evidence of matter being created or destroyed. Change, yes. You can take anything and smash it to powder. Well, when I die, there'll be gases coming off, and the plants will get taller, and the vultures will get a little fatter. But if I don't die, I'll on the outside. But, but you can't. You destroy the organization called Fresco, but the stuff he's made of will go back into bugs and insects and other things. Well, it's a terrible thing. I'd rather believe I go on and meet all my loved ones. That's why people are so easily persuaded by you're a good man and your kindness will be rewarded. Now, that's a good thing to say in church. And the church people, all the Bible is subject to interpretation. Everything written. That's why you have Seventh Day Adventists, the Catholic, subject to interpretation. Science is not. Thank you for your time. I hope we're still friends. <laughs>